As a follower of Jesus Christ, it's important to understand that he expects us to behave differently because we're following in his steps, using the Bible as our guide. As the Apostle Peter says, and looking forward to the day when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in your lives of holiness and godliness? My name is Jim Stiles, and this is the second session on the topic of citizenship. In this session, we're going to look at the Bible's guidance about contracts that we make, agreements that we make in this life, how we behave at our workplace, and how we must show kindness, even when we're falsely accused. You can remember back in Genesis chapter 9, remember when God destroyed the earth with a flood and saved Noah and his family? Remember how God put a rainbow up in the sky as a reminder that he keeps his promises and he expects that we will keep our promises too. And that applies from God's perspective. It applies to all the promises and the covenants and the contracts that we make today. God wants us to be faithful to our promises just like he is. We are following in his steps. You may remember back in the Old Testament in Joshua chapter 9, remember when the children of Israel were coming into the land and they were starting to take over the land of Israel. And Joshua didn't ask God at one point whether he should accept the Gibeonites. When they came to him and they pretended to be from a faraway land, they had old clothes on, they had worn out cheese and moldy cheese. And they came to Joshua and they said, oh, we're not from this land. Make a covenant with us, an agreement that you'll let us live. Now, that was deception. The Gibeonites had deceived Joshua because it was truly a lie. And many Israelites thought Joshua should kill the Gibeonites anyway because they lied about where they came from. But Joshua and the leaders of Israel had made an agreement before their God, the God of Israel, that they would let these people live. So they had to make a decision. Do we go ahead and and kill all the Gibeonites or do we honor our agreement? And they decided that it was more important to honor that agreement than it was to to kill the Gibeonites. And you know what happened? God blessed that decision. He worked with the Gibeonites. He brought some of them into the community. They became converted to the God of Israel. And for years afterwards, some of their descendants were faithful members of that community. You may also remember, a little bit later on, this is at the end of the time of the kings of Israel, the last king was Zedekiah. And in order to get Zedekiah to try to follow the the commands of the king of Babylon, then Zedekiah was sort of encouraged to make an agreement, a covenant with the king of Babylon, with Nebuchadnezzar, probably through Jeremiah's influence. So he makes a covenant and he promises, I won't rebel. I'm not going to rebel against you, King Nebuchadnezzar. But then what does he do? He goes ahead and he rebels anyways later on in his life. And God held Zedekiah responsible for not keeping that covenant. And he removed him as the king. Because the Bible's guidance is that God expects us to be faithful to promises and covenants and agreements that we make. Now you look at where that might apply today. That's certainly applied to business contracts that we make. To things that happen with home improvements in our house and we sign contracts. God expects us to keep the contracts that we make. He's trying to train us to be faithful to him. It isn't just that he wants us to keep contracts. It's faithfulness that he's after. He's trying to improve our characters to be like him. He is faithful and he wants us to be faithful as well. And these are opportunities to practice that faithfulness. You look at wedding contracts that we make, covenants that people make. I was just uh, watching a wedding yesterday and I watched the young people say, I do. And they do that in the presence of the angels and before God and all the witnesses. And once we do that, God expects us to keep our promise and fulfill our covenant, even if it costs us. That isn't the issue. It's faithfulness to a covenant. And God's trying to train us to submit to him and give our, he's he's, he's trying to train us in that, that we will learn to give our lives in service of others. And, And it doesn't matter that it's equal or fair. It's a training program that God is using the same way he trained Jesus Christ. So what about at the workplace? What if you're on the job and you're out there working at your, at your job? Does God expect us to be faithful there as well? Well, look at the words of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. Servants, 
be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and you're beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. You see, when we look at the Lord Jesus Christ and we see the way they treated him before his crucifixion and we watch the way the Romans and the Jews both treated Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we learn from that that he was like a sheep led to the slaughter. He accepted those things because he knew his God was in control and he knew that God was going to use this to save so many people. He trusted God's training program and we have been called to do the same. And it's not just a case when our, when our bosses are just and they're, and they're nice and they do all great things for us. But Peter says, even when they are unjust, we still have to use the example of Jesus Christ and trust that God is in control. There's another case where Paul writes to the Ephesians and he reminds them, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. So when we're, when we're working at our jobs and when our employers ask us to do something, we don't just do it to look good. We do it because we care about the people. We want to demonstrate to our bosses and our fellow employees that the life of Jesus Christ is guiding our lives and it's changing the way that we behave. So we do it from our heart, not just because we have to. So what about the issues of kindness and faithfulness? Even when you're falsely accused or enslaved, does that give us excuses to misbehave? Well, you may remember the story of the man Joseph. Remember in Genesis chapter 39, Joseph was wrongfully accused. He was put in prison, but God ended up using it for good. Remember how Joseph's brothers treated him? They mistreated him all the time. They hated him. They put him down in a pit. They sold him off as a slave to Egypt, and off he goes, and they, they convinced their dad that he probably was killed. And then when Joseph gets to Egypt, he's working for Potiphar, and he gets falsely accused and thrown in prison again. And Joseph could have like rebelled. He could have said he wasn't going to you know, be involved anymore, give it up on God. But he didn't do that. He trusted God to work in those bad circumstances, realizing that God was in control. And in the end, when finally his brothers came down to meet him, he could freely forgive them because he knew that God was in control. And he didn't blame them for what they had done. It's a great attitude that we can have. You may remember the story in 2 Kings chapter 5. There was a young Jewish slave who had been captured by the Syrians. She was taken from Israel all the way up into Syria, and she was now working for a man who was the, the commander of the Syrian army, a man named Naaman. But Naaman developed leprosy. He was sick. Now this young Jewish girl, she could have just been you know, sad and she could have been discouraged and angry that she had been taken as a slave, and she could have refused to help. But what does she do? she tells Naaman about a prophet in Israel who can cure him. And Naaman goes to that prophet, the prophet Elisha, and Elisha says to dip in the Jordan River seven times, and at first he doesn't want to do it, but in the end he realized, sure, go ahead and do that. And when he dipped in that river seven times, he was healed. And in the end, this Jewish slave girl was a part of converting this man to the true God of Israel, all because she kept a good attitude and she submitted to her position in life. See, the Bible does give us good, practical advice for how to live today. We need to read it every day and look for that advice. Look for the advice of how to live, how to treat people, and also about the coming kingdom of Christ. And we can trust God's advice because he loves us and he wants what's best for us today and in the future. So thanks for joining us today. In our next session, we're going to look at how godly principles affect the way we treat other people and teach us to be honest with each other. 